Hi, it's Tom here. And before we get into this episode of the podcast, I just want to let you all know about a new addition to Spiked, and that's our very own Spiked shop. Christmas is coming and we've got the perfect gifts for the pro-Brexit, pro-freedom people in your life. You can get t-shirts, hoodies, tote bags and mugs sporting some of your favourite Spike slogans from ban nothing, question everything to love Europe, hate the EU. Just go to spiked-online.com and hit the dark blue shop button in the top right corner to check out the full range and make your purchases. Now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to the Spikes podcast. I'm Tom Slater, filling in for Fraser Myers today. And joining me this week, I have Spikes columnist Ella Whelan. Hi. And Spikes columnist Tim Black. Hi. So today we're going to be talking about just one thing, the election campaign so far, the speeches, the gaffes, the resignations, the controversies, and what the next few weeks may have in store. Whatever the fire brigade said, we would leave a burning building. It just seems the common sense thing to do. Johnson's Trump deal Brexit puts a price tag on our national health service. The TV debate cannot and should not exclude the only woman leader. Let's get Brexit done. Get on with our project of sensible, moderate tax cutting conservative. The general election campaign officially began this week and already it is looking to be one of the most messy and significant elections for decades. In the past few days alone, we've seen a cabinet minister and the deputy leader of the Labour Party step down. We've seen outrage over Jacob Rees-Mogg's comments about the Grenfell Tower report. We've seen broadcast journalists empty chairing Tory ministers. There's been talk of electoral pacts, worries about split votes and an awful lot of uncertainty about where this might all be headed. So we're going to try and cover as much as we possibly can and pick through all of the different stories that have been floating around this week. So, Tim, to kick things off, there is a kind of consensus for me <laughs> that it's been a pretty awful start for the Tories, you know, shadows of 2017 and the complete hash they made of that campaign. What do you make of things so far? Uh, well, it's not been a, it's not been a great start. Um, the principal problem is that whatever message the Tories wanted to launch with just seems to have got lost amidst all these... Uh, I would say scandals, but they're not really scandals. Uh, they're just various gaffes, low level kind of mendacity, perhaps on the part of the, the Welsh minister who had to resign because he, he claimed not to have known about an aide who had collapsed the rape trial, but it turned out he did know. This is Alan Cairns. This is Alan Cairns, yeah. Um, of course, the, the fuss over the Keir Starmer video, uh, which the Tories published, uh, and edited it to make Keir Starmer. Uh, look none too coherent when it comes to Labour's position on Brexit, although quite where they needed to edit it, no one's quite sure. Um, <laughs> the, and of course the Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, mis, misspeaking, if you like, over, uh, Grenfell Tower. And it means that all this kind of guff, you know, this kind of chuff that's been chucked up into the air has just obscured what was meant to be, certainly for the Tories, a really clear electoral proposition, mm. which was uh, this was going to be an election about Brexit and the Tories were going to be the the Brexit party uh, w- with a small p. Um, and that's just got lost. So, you know, the Tories did actually launch their campaign uh, on Wednesday and barely anybody has been able to extract anything from it because it's just been concealed and covered up and it means it's right from the start and you're right to mention the kind of shades of 2017 uh the tories ability to to actually shape the narrative just seems to have disappeared uh the narrative is being shaped by uh a media and various remain parties which who who are just feasting on every miss misspeak uh every uh gaffe that the tories have made and and i just i just worry the the core thing which is Let's face it, this, this election is going to be about Brexit. It's being lost already. Ella, what's your thoughts so far? Yeah, it has been a bit embarrassing. I mean, especially the Mog kind of semi-scandal or whatever you want to call it, because not only did he uh, not just put a foot wrong, but managed to insult um, victims of the Grenfell Tower tragedy, which is like political suicide, then was followed on by Andrew Bridgen kind of doubling down um, in this really bizarre way and saying that Jacob Rees-Mogg was a very clever person. We wanted clever people in um, Parliament and then being contradicted by James Cleverly. I mean, it was just the biggest kind of PR mm. mess. And I suppose we see, cl- I mean, I'm sure everyone's seen it so far, but this is Jacob Rees-Mogg on LBC seeming to say something to the effect of... Um, if more people had ignored mm. the fire services advice and that if he was in that situation, he would have done it. Yeah, so it's kind of misspeaking, but in a way that could easily be weaponized against him to make it seem like he was criticizing the victim. Yeah. The key word he used was common sense, um, suggest, which people 
argued, suggested that the people who were in the Grenfell tragedy didn't have common sense. I mean, the, the more wrong part of his statement was that he claimed at the start that it wasn't to do with issues of and policies of class and race. And of course, anyone who's been following anything in relation to the investigation to Grenfell knows that it had something to do with the fact that these residents were ignored because they were from a certain section of society. But putting that aside, I think it's indicative of the fact that the they Tories haven't managed to coalesce around this really clear vision of Brexit. And so you've kind of got a lot, you've got individuals who are almost like wildcards until really quite recently and even still ongoing. There's a massive crisis in that party and they haven't managed to pull it together for this election campaign. Can we talk about Tom Watson a bit? Because this is something that I mean, is very fresh as we're recording this on Thursday. Um, so last night, whilst the Tories were launching their campaign in Birmingham, Tom Watson, ever with the sense of timing, says that he's stepping down both as um, deputy leader of the Labour Party and as an MP. Um, and it's provoked, um, obviously, a lot of discussion about what this means for the Labour campaign and what this means for the soul of the Labour Party, as he was seen as someone who was kind of a, the last holdout and the figurehead of the moderates in the midst of the Corbyn takeover. But it's also been really striking the discussion of it since then, you know, especially because there seems to be a bit of a rewriting of history, the sense that Tom Watson is a moderate, is incredibly sensible, despite the fact as we all know, this is a bloke who, you know, fronted the campaign for the shackling of the press and who used parliamentary privilege to spread conspiracy theories about paedophiles um, and really didn't cover himself in glory in the midst of all of that. Tim, what did you make of the kind of response to that big bombshell? I think the most remarkable thing about the uh, response, certainly on... Uh, the Remain side, because you might as well talk about all the parties that support Rem- Remain as almost being like part of one side, was that they were w- willing to ignore everything that Tom Watson actually did throughout his parliamentary career and just turn, you know, almost like sanctify him. It was a perfect example of, uh, you know, what, what effectively is Remain washing. It doesn't matter what you might have done in your, pol- in your political career, what you might have stood for, and no matter how reprehensible, certainly in the eyes of, uh, certainly in what would have been the eyes of the left, if, if you support Remain right now, all of that is you're absolved, you're absolved of anything you might have done. You are a, uh, a, a good person. So Tom Watson has just, has, has been sanctified almost entirely because he supports Remain, despite the fact that, yeah, Tom, as you mentioned, there is the, uh, his promotion of the, paedophile scandal at the heart of Westminster, basically recycling what effectively was like an urban myth that's been hanging around since the 1970s, which was always premised on the idea that the Tories and the establishment are so evil that they are abusing children and murdering them. And Tom Watson is parroting that, using parliamentary privilege to parrot it too. And he's he's parroting it three decades later, um, and he he continuing to ruin the lives of of those he was accusing, and also the families of those he was accusing. It's terrible. Ella, let's turn for a second just to the to the Lib Dems because we haven't mentioned them so far. I think one of the um, striking things so far is how much Joe Swinson has been leaning on identity politics. <laughs> so there's been this big row over the ITV debates, the leader debates, which are going to be Jeremy Corbyn versus Boris Johnson, the Lib Dems launching some sort of legal challenge, at least kind of um, trying to fire a bit of a warning shot. But again, her argument very explicitly is this is sexism, you know, <laughs> the, the reason that she's not being introduced to these debates. She's made comments previously about, you know, these two old white guys dominating the debate and all the rest of it. What do you make of her leaning on those kind of pretty lame identitarian arguments and all of this? Well, it's funny because it's embarrassing. And the interesting thing is quite a lot of other people are saying it's embarrassing. So I mean, even Channel 4, which is the kind of home for these complaints um, and claims of prejudice, whether it be about race, sex, gender, um, even Kathy Newman said to her, for God's sake, come on, Like this isn't about sexism. <laughs> this is to do with popularity. Uh, the difficult thing is, I mean, she's done this several times that you mentioned back in late October. She said, you know, this is, you know, Brexit and this whole scenario is just run by six white men. I mean, seemingly forgetting that her has, herself is white. And so that kind of comment didn't exactly land in the way she hoped it would. Um, and then more recently in relation to the television debates, she's, she's kind of almost sounding conspiratorial. She said, and this is a, a quote, these two, meaning Corbyn and Johnson, have got together and said, let's just do it together and pretend that it's something we can decide. So in, in her over world, in her overinflated ego, <laughs> what Johnson and Corbyn are worried about is blocking Swinson out of a debate. It's, it's crazy. Um, but the whole I'm a woman and so I'm being discriminated against thing is so old in, in British politics. And it's just so overused. We've had a whole host of different MPs claiming that they've faced sexism in relation to Brexit, everyone forgetting that we've had a female Prime Minister, Theresa May, um, and that uh, politics does not at the moment have a gender problem. It's got a democracy problem. Um, so it's really, really cheap. And I mean, she's also suffering when she, when she, 
kind of invokes this whole identity politics plea, it always bites her back on the ass because what's happening at the moment, there's a sort of semi-scandal rubbling with her inability to, or her refusal to step down and make Angela Smith or her husband resign. Angela Smith, that's uh, the notorious funny tinge MP, um, whose husband said that Dawn Butler was lying about claims of racism. So th- this is a kind of mess that she shouldn't get into <laughs> because it inevitably never works out. Um, and it isn't working out. That being said... I can't work out whether or not it seems like she should be part of that leadership debate because, I mean, the Lib Dems aren't exactly, she's not going to get into number 10 or I'll eat my hat if she does. It seems like it would be some kind of a miracle or a nightmare, however you want to view it. But then again, I mean, the phenomenon of the Liberal Democrats is significant and blocking them out of a debate like this allows them to play this kind of ridiculous victim card that is so favoured of mm. Remainers of claiming that their side is not being represented. So, I mean, I have to say it is rather a boring fight over who is being blocked from getting on a television programme. It's so strange. It does seem to be the kind of repeat of that kind of like Hillary Clinton playbook in some respects. And you have these kind of really status quo elite politicians whose, you know, economic programme, anything like that, has no sense of dynamism whatsoever and they just kind of ladle a bit of identitarian kind mm. of grievance mongering on top of it to make it seem a bit more interesting um tim moving away from the lib dems then so much of the discussion so far has been about the kind of battle fronts in this election now there's many of them particularly the tories they've got a fight on their hands in scotland they've got a fight on their hands in london in the southwest but particularly there's been a lot of focus on what is referred to as the kind of red wall so very old labor territory in the midlands in wales in other places um which the tories are really hoping to pick up support to do even better than theresa may did last time to try and flip constituencies blue which have even never voted tory before or very rarely in their history what do you make of that whole strategy do you think it's a goer it's something that yeah it's something the tories um have to do as much as anything else if they're going to secure a majority uh, which is obviously the only way in which they can finally get brexit done um, it's, it, you know what, it's actually very difficult to tell. It's very difficult. You know, we can only speculate, uh, about, um, how resistant some of those long time Labour voters, but at the same time, Brexit supporting Labour voters, whether they can overcome what must be a lifetime of, you know, animus towards the, the, the Tories and vote for them because they think that's their best chance of achieving what they vote for in, in, in 2016. You know, at this moment, it's impossible to tell. The the big variable in all this is is what Brexit Party will do in all these constituencies. Because obviously there's a lot of talk about Brexit Party targeting these died-in-the-wool Labour constituencies as as their best, you know, died-in-the-wool Labour constituencies uh, that voted leave in 2016. Because for the Brexit Party, that's seen as their best chance to win a seat. And of course, we don't know whether that will therefore undermine the Conservative Party's efforts or perhaps, perhaps it will aid them. Perhaps there are, that, that the Conservative Party will be able to pick up enough support and the Brexit Party will peel enough voters off the Labour support uh, for the Tories to, to get these seats. But at, at this moment, it's just very, very difficult to tell. Ella, what do you make of all this? Well, it's interesting you had that the phenomenon of Workington Man cooked up by a think tank, the suggestion that this is the kind of stereotype of the northern voter of whom the, you know, things like this rugby supporting, salt of the earth, non-graduate, who the Tories need to pick up off of Labour in order to win. And to his credit, Nigel Farage said, this is really patronising, this kind of stereotyping is ridiculous, we're not going to buy into this. Unfortunately, he then went and bumped into a Workington man um, on the campaign trail who was a Labour supporter who, you know, spun the kind of usual criticisms of your spreading hatred and all that against Nigel Farage. And they disagreed on the issue of a second referendum. I think that we'd be misled if we underestimated the entrenchment of these kind of party um, loyalties, because I think that part of the problem not not celebrating this is that because Brexit has been spun out for three years um, because people feel really knackered and because largely it's turned into this kind of petty fight about trade policies. It's kind of had all the oomph taken out of it to a certain extent. Then it's, there's, you know, fair ground for Labour to come back and say, no, we want to talk about the NHS. We want to talk about, you know, their economic policy is you know, as always, isn't groundbreaking, but it's it's better than the Tories, or at least it's talking about spending more and, and got a slightly more ambitious. So, you know, the worry is that people will 
buy into this idea as Brexit is just another policy initiative and stick with their um, party loyalties. I think the only way that that could um, change is if the Brexit party in particular really differentiate themselves from the Tories in the kind of the hardness of the Brexit option and also kind of try to spin it more on, which I think they are successfully doing, on the political aspect of it, the democratic aspect of it, and leave the whole kind of this shtick of we're we're um you know we're businessmen we do good deals the whole boris johnson line of like get it finished get it over with as if it's just this kind of tick box activity but I, you know i'm not i'm not hopeful I haven't given up yet but i'm not hopeful that this is going to really shake people out of their mm. old party loyalties there does seem to be a slightly strange assumption in this mainly coming from tory supporters of course that boris johnson is the candidate that the midlands and the north and the northeast have just been waiting for which seems mm. to be a bit of a stretch it's interesting there's a bit of analysis as well which seems to suggest that um really the intention here is less because actually one thing that's not really talked about much in terms of 2017 is the how well theresa may did with those kind of labor leave voters she picked up an awful lot of support in those kinds of areas it just wasn't enough and she ended up picking up i think it was about six kind of labor leave seats and there's a lot of discussion actually about really the aim is not necessarily to pick up more of those people but to hope the other parties do worse you have a kind of 1983 situation where the opposition are infighting your vote doesn't necessarily go up but you still take those kinds of seats so even then there feels like you know i don't think any of us ever thought that suddenly the tory party were going to become you know the party of working to man or whatever stereotype we're using but even then it seems to be a little bit more kind of tactical and opportunistic Ellie, you touched on the Labour Party there, and we haven't talked too much about them just yet. Jeremy Corbyn gave a speech in Harlow in Essex earlier this week in which he made his pitch, which is clearly going to be the pitch of the campaign, which is that Boris Johnson is Conservatives. They want to deliver this Trump deal Brexit. (laughs) They want to deregulate. They want to serve you up maggots and your orange juice. And he very much tried to kind of sidestep the issue of Brexit. Why would I want to talk to the 52% or the 48%? I want to talk to the 99%. Whilst at the very same time, making very clear that Labour's position is not to rip up its deal with Europe to do the second referendum, which would be Remain versus a flavour of Remain in the form of a Labour Brexit. You know, will this wash for them? Will they be able to, as they seem to have been able to in the last election to some extent, kind of sidestep the issue of Brexit and pick up some support that way? Do you think that's going to work? I'm not sure because the point is Labour has been saying for a long time and in its speech in Harlow, um, you know, Corbyn asserted, you know, this really isn't complicated. And yet their Brexit policy is hugely complicated mm. and counterintuitive. I mean, you know, it's it's embarrassing watching them try to describe it um, and explain it in speeches on the media and on the doorstep where, you know, as you said, it's basically we believe in Remain, but we're going to fake this deal that we none of us really like and then put it to you in a referendum that will be for all intents and purposes Remain versus Remain. And there's 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 no real way you can spin that positively. It, it is to positive um, policy. It's confusing and it's disingenuous. I think that people will, even their own supporters have been kind of complaining for a long time that the Labour Party policy on Brexit hasn't been clear and it hasn't been clarified. It is the same thing that we've been hearing for the last year or so. And, you know, you get the distinct sense that Corbyn doesn't really believe it either. I mean, the fact that he began that speech in Harlow by profusely thanking Keir Starmer for all the wonderful job he's done over the last three years. I mean, everyone and their mother knows that those two hate each other. So that's just ridiculous to do that kind of thing. And to suggest that this has been, you know, backed up by claims that, you know, this massive speech about how the NHS is going to be sold off to Trump, which is really kind of a conspiracy theory at this stage. I'm not sure that it is going to work because, I mean, like you said, he he said this line of why would I want to speak to half the country? I want to speak to the whole country. It means denying the fundamental reality that everyone knows about the Brexit debate. You have to pick a side. So, you know, he's not going to win over the kind of hardcore Remainers, which are crystallising within the Labour vote. And this is going to really piss off every Leave voter with a head on their shoulders. So... I don't think it's particularly a successful way to go forward. Tim, what do you make of the Labour pitch so far? Well, it, it, it might not be successful, but in, in some ways it's what certainly Corbyn needs to do. They need to almost sweep Brexit back under under the carpet, almost just mm. reduce it to just one policy amongst all the others and certainly not the certainly not the most important one. It is obviously their Brexit policy. It is utterly incoherent. It's simple, as Corbyn keeps saying, it's simple. There's nothing to not understand about it, but it's incoherent. Things could be incoherent and understandable. And I keep thinking, let's say they put a second referendum. Uh, Labour get in, there's a second referendum. Uh, who on earth is going to campaign for 
Labour's deal. Mm. Like it, it certainly wouldn't need any uh, Russian money to fund that campaign. You know, you, no way you could exceed spending limits to support that because there'd be no one there to spend any money on at all. They will have no supporters. <laughs> uh, it's a bit utterly, utterly bizarre. So far, though, Labour are benefiting from the Tories' inability to frame this election in the way that they want to. They, because originally it was talk of it being a people versus parliament election. Yeah. And that's almost key because that's the only way in which the Tories can overcome the, what Ella was talking about, those traditional political loyalties. If, if people stop thinking of themselves in terms of parties, but thinking of themselves as, as part of the people against, against parliament. And the Tories, are failing to do that. And that's why the Reese Mogg gaffe stood out because it was then able to be mobilized, uh, on behalf of the Remain to say that, look how out of touch that these people, these people really are in the, mm. t- these Tories really are. They're not like you or me. They are distinct, different. And the Tories have to keep fighting back about it, but they just seem incapable of doing so. As Thomas says, is, is Boris Johnson really the man, really the man of the people? Uh, it, it seems unlikely. I keep, Think of the Tories launch as well. It had, it had the font on, on the podium where it says un- unleashing Britain's potential. And it's written in that kind of pub sandwich board font, mm. you know, because that, you know, that's how sort of authentically of the people the Tories are. So that's what they desperately want to be. But everything they do and say <laughs> keeps undercutting it. <laughs> and you, you can see how bad they're doing just in terms of the salience of kind of Brexit as an issue in some of the polls. So there's a YouGov poll out recently said over the last 10 days, Brexit has gone from being the most important issue, according to 70% of the people down to 59%. You're seeing health creep up, the economy, environment, et cetera. So you can really almost see in real time how much they're they're failing to make this the, the Brexit election. And, but then it suggests that it, Labour's launch may look relatively chaotic, but it, it, in, in terms of Labour, once again, just as in 2017, you know, prioritising what seemed what are so-called bread and butter mm. issues, it does seem to does seem to be working. But at the same time, I think it's, it's important to kind of push back on the Labour line, which is almost that Brexit is kind of unimportant, is that it's a distraction because it's so clear going into this election that Brexit is the primary thing at threat. You know, the Remain alliance, however discoordinated and infighting it is, you know, they are pegging their hopes on some sort of coalition government whereby they could have a kind of stitch up second referendum. This is all very much in play. But as you say, it just speaks to the kind of, you know, the crapness of the Tories in, in, a, in order to kind of force that issue. But I still think, you know, many people are going to have to find the as best means possible to try and reassert that issue, I guess, going forward. Mm. Another big mistake that the Tories have made, and it's a cheap one, is doing the whole, really going for the whole kind of Corbyn as a trot, Corbyn as a Stalinist, Corbyn as a Corbyn socialist. is Stalin, yeah, well, <laughs> according to the front page yeah, of the Telegraph this week. Yeah, and um, you know, Boris Johnson saying that he hasn't seen the kind of um, visceral Point, viciousness of the Labour Party pointing its finger at people, supposedly bankers or rich people, since Stalin and the Kulaks. And it's it's that kind of ridiculous hyperbole and panic that will really hurt them because that's where the Labour Party can come back in and say, see, they're really scared. The big money bankers are really scared. And it's really infantile. <laughs> um, and it, it just doesn't wash with voters. And even worse, it allows the Labour Party to have this kind of sheen of radicalism that it really doesn't. I mean, if you look at, you know, I, I just kind of praise to a certain extent um, the Labour Party's economic policy, but one of the, the main parts of it, the McDonald's plan about kind of forcing companies to reinvest 10% of their profits would allow workers to have 500 quid extra a year. I mean, that is not kind of, you know, rah rah socialist in my view so it's this kind of it's also disappointing you get it I don't know if people ever watch Question Time anymore but I'm sick of hearing people making these barnstorming kind of Brexit contributions really slamming it to the Labour Party and ending it with and we must you know fight back against the Marxist Jeremy Corbyn (laughs) and you just sigh and think for Christ's sake this is not where his politics are at it's not where politics is at in general so they're both as bad as each other whether it be the Labour Party saying you know that fat cats in the Tory parties are um, trying to sell off the NHS and then Johnson just lowers the tone again and calls him a Stalinist. I don't think it leaves anyone uh, better off and it's it's allowing the Labour Party to clean up, I think. In, yeah, it, it, it does lower the tone in one way, but another way, at least Johnson's picking a relatively niche historical analogy here rather than just a standard... Uh, you're a fascist or you're a Nazi. Hmm. But again, almost that speaks of Johnson's tin ear for any uh, so-called populist rhetoric. You know, 
comparing um, Corbyn to Stalin is one thing, but then to liken it to a very specific moment in the mm. 1930s and the persecution of That's know, incredibly get wealthy through, peasantry. Yeah. You know, it doesn't get any cut through. It's just, <laughs> it's really self-indulgent in some ways on, on, on Johnson's part. And while we're on the issue of Russia. Tim, this is something that you wrote about this week. There's a kind of new Remainer conspiracy theory, or at least a reheated Remainer conspiracy theory, in relation to the infiltration of Russian influence into our political process. Um, this new claim that's doing the rounds about um, Dominic Cummings, the number 10 key advisor, actually being some sort of Russian asset. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about this? In some ways, there's not too much to tell. I think it stems from the revelation, if you can call it that, that uh, after he graduated from Oxford in the early 90s. Uh, he s- then spent three years in Russia uh, between 94 and 97. Very suspicious. Uh, very suspicious. Uh, no one's quite sure what he, what he got up to there. Presumably, uh, he was groomed at some point by Putin with... Putin being the evil genius that is, he knew that some way along the line, perhaps in 20 years or so, there would be a referendum on membership of the EU and that's when Cummings would be activated, Agent Cummings, <laughs> um, and he would then be able to use some of Putin's ill-gotten gains to use some psychographic advertising to convince a lot of people, millions of people, to vote against the EU. And so it's all a big Putin master plan. Uh, It's obviously utterly absurd. Uh, We don't know quite what Cummings was doing in 94, uh, between 94 and 97. And beyond the fact that he seemed to uh, fraternise a little bit with the basically... Uh, Russian lobby group called uh, Conservative Friends of Russia, which was established in 2012 uh, and basically seemed to fold in 2012 after publicising Chris Bryant's wife fronts on Twitter. So it, it didn't go particularly well. But apart from that, apart from this trip to Russia in the mid-90s and fraternising with the Conservative Friends of Russia group in 2012, there seems to be very little to connect <laughs> Uh, Agent Cummings uh, to the KGB or the FSB, as it's as it's now known, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter because if you are a Remainer conspiracy theorist, then a lot of Remainers just seem to embrace some form of conspiracism. The two uh, go quite well together. It the, feels. They do seem to go quite well together. You've got two dots very far apart, and they've joined them, and they're asking all their supporters to join those two two dots uh, because there you've got the secret and the reason why Brexit happened, which was of mm. course. Uh, as we all know, because Putin planned it. And it's just so dispiriting to constantly have to feel that you've got to defend what happened in 2016 as a, as what it was, which was a, it was a democratic vote in which people carefully considered whether they wanted to stay in the EU or leave it. It had nothing to do with Russia, but we still have to defend it. We should probably point out it wasn't just kind of FBP kind of lunatics as well. Emily Thornbury, the shadow uh, foreign secretary, wrote to Dominic Raab asking if um, Cummings had been properly vetted and all the rest of it. It kind of links in as well with something that we've seen um, really become part of the narrative, at least where the media is concerned with this election, Ella, in re- in relation to advertising. So there's been a lot of discussion in recent weeks about whether or not Facebook should ban political advertising. And it's been interesting that both Channel 4 and the BBC have launched these kind of initiatives asking people to essentially email in with any political ads they see just to see where, I guess, where the dark money is flowing in this election. Mm-hmm. What do you make of the fact that this question of political advertising is, is suddenly been put so front and centre? Is it people getting their potentially excuses in early or is there something else going on? I think it is a massive cop out because what it does, if you're a politician, if you, and they've all done it, um, even before the general election was announced, there there was talk and people would say on radio and television programs when they interviewed, well, of course, if a general election happens, then we've got to brace ourselves for the onslaught of misinformation and, and spin and lies. And everyone brings up the fact that, you know, oh, the Electoral Commission is still investigating vote leave and ignores the fact that vast number of Remain organisations were fined um, for similar issues in that referendum and overspending and all that kind of stuff that we all know. Um, but polit- what politicians do is by s- saying that early cop out, oh, you know, we're going to be sort of fed by misinformation. Then what happens is they take the gaze off themselves. They take, they kind of shelve the criticism that says, that says actually it's your words and your actions that matter. I mean, the Channel 4 hashtag target voter campaign is a really great example of this. So it's, you know, it's a preemptive panic um, <laughs> using the example of both the GMB video, which we've already talked about, which, you know, an a fool can tell is edited um, and is not a true representation of Keir Starmer. Um, 
alongside the bus with the 500 million pounds that Labour put on it and so sort of trying to be measured about it. But essentially the message is from Channel 4, you are going to be spun at and it's going to be really difficult for you to differentiate truth from lies. Um, and so we're here to help you. It's really, it's really kind of insulting to voters. I mean, political spin and exaggeration and you know, mudslinging has been around since politics has been around and people are well used to this. The difference is today is that I think politicians are much less sure of themselves and their own authority. So it's a great tactic to kind of point to, you know, in previously we've had it called fake news, of which also Channel 4 ran a big campaign on in 2016 and 2017, to try and essentially block the blame from them when their policies or their announcements are heavily scrutinised. Your average voter doesn't need a university degree or a PhD in political science to know when something is being exaggerated. So it's the kind of, it's a bit of a unpleasant situation that we're in, in which I think we're going to spend the next two months being talked to like we're mm. children being taught how to read the news. So I just want to try and end this on a slightly more positive note. <laughs> We've talked a lot about the, um, the shamelessness of the kind of remain parties in this campaign already, the crapness to some extent of the, uh, of some of the leave parties so far, um, the weirdness of some of the media discussion. But again, this election, as we've been talking about, is such a huge opportunity. The electorate have been shut out from this process for so long and Brexit hangs in the balance. Tim first, you know, Brexit is the main issue of this election. It's really the thing that hangs in the balance. How can listeners, how can people who still care about that issue of democracy really push that envelope going forward? Because it seems, as you've said, to have been a little bit lost so far. Yeah, well, you, you, know, you, you mentioned us all being a bit sort of downbeat. We've, we're only being downbeat about the the campaigning groups, either parties at this point, uh, in terms of the actual electorate, there's nothing to be downbeat about at all. As a Brexit supporting voter, you will vote for the party who, which you think provides you with the best opportunity of managing to actually finally, finally defeat those who've desperately tried to overturn that result in, in, in 2016. And you will know wherever you live, you know, how best to do that. Ella. I think Tim's right that even though the different parties might try and make this not about Brexit, it is about Brexit. And what you have to remember is that we've been waiting for this election for a very long time. And voters have been held away from exercising their political power for a very long time. And so, you know, whether or not you feel knackered by this whole process, I mean, you really, it's incumbent on you to get invigorated by this because it's very important that this general election sends a message to parliamentarians that they cannot get away with ignoring a democratic vote. And, you know, even for me, I, I'm in a constituency in which uh, it would take a miracle to shake the Labour Party politician who represents that constituency. However, um, I think there is space in even just informal groups outside of political parties where um, Leave voters are making their voices heard. And I think it's time to put aside all other issues and understand that unless Brexit happens, meaning the vote from 2016 is enacted, all other policy areas are impossible because the failure to support that very important vote that we took in 2016 would be a failure to respect and enact democracy and uh, we'd be in a very dark place if that happened. Well, I suppose we should also remember that cam the campaign's barely a week old. We've already got Philip Hammond not standing. We've already got Anna Subri standing, but almost certain to lose her seats mm -hmm. on so many issues. You know, and Tom Watson's gone, which I mean, that made my week anyway. Instant dividend else, yeah. for reason and democracy. <laughs> You've been listening to the Spike Podcast. Please do subscribe if you haven't already to get the show direct every week. If you enjoy the show, please do take a second to leave us a rating and a review with your podcast provider. It's a great way for us to reach new people. And if you really enjoy the show and you'd like us to help us continue to do what we do, please do consider making a donation. Just go to spiked-online.com and hit the big red donate button in the top right corner. Anything you can give is greatly appreciated. Thanks so much and see you next time.